debt limit deal heads to Congress, but even if it doesn't pass, the man responsible for watching over Colorado's finances says the state is ready for what's next. Thousands of migrants have made the choice to brave the journey to the United States. For their friends and family waiting on this side of the border, the worry while waiting is often difficult. There's days that I'm like, well, is today gonna be the day? A longtime runner crosses the Boulder Boulder finish line for the 43rd time thanks to a push from her friends. And this Memorial Day, we can help build a lasting tribute, one fit for a hero. That's tonight on Next. We are at the end of the month, and you know what that means. It's time to pay some bills. President Joe Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy say they've come to an agreement to raise the debt ceiling and pay creditors. Now they just have to get Congress on board despite some vocal holdouts. The House is expected to vote on the deal on Wednesday. It would suspend the debt limit through 2025 while also limiting non-defense spending. Colorado Representatives Lauren Boebert and Ken Buck have already come out against the proposal. House Republicans have already passed their own debt limit bill, but it included major spending cuts that didn't make it into the light latest proposal. If a deal is not approved soon, federal employees and people who rely on federal benefits could start feeling the squeeze in the next few weeks. But Colorado Treasurer Dave Young says, at least in the short term, the state's finances are in good shape. While we see uh, some uncertainty at the federal level uh, of its ability to meet its obligations, uh, taxpayers here in the state of Colorado and uh, Colorado residents should not be concerned about state government. We, we are funded uh, many months out into the future to meet all of our obligations. That's not to say Colorado's finances would not be impacted in the long term. If the U.S. credit rating takes a dip, interest rates are likely to go up. That coupled with lost tax revenue from job loss or business closures could take a sizable cut out of the state's budget. As hard as it is for migrants to make the journey to the United States, it's a different kind of difficult for people waiting on this side of the border for friends and family. Angeline McCall spoke with one man who says every single day he prays for his friend's safe arrival, even when he hasn't heard from her in weeks. Every day is another day of waiting for a message. I'm just playing the waiting game basically until, until she can respond. Efrain Herrera has been expecting his friend Sofia to arrive from Venezuela. The last time I heard from her, it was April 21st of this year, 2023. So it's been over a month. So there hasn't been no response. So I don't know. She must not have any uh, access to her, you know, to communicate. He doesn't know if her phone was stolen, lost or if something else happened. Yeah, I mean, every day I get concerned and I'm thinking about her and I pray and all kinds of things like, you know, when when am I gonna hear from her again? Like, I mean, I think of the worst, but I also try not to think of the worst and just have faith on her to arrive here safely. Throughout the weeks, he's messaged asking, where are you? Asking if she's okay and when he might hear from her again. The clock is ticking, so. And just hoping for the best and not the worst. The last he knew, she was in Panama. Yeah, it's been, it's been a good five weeks now. But now, she could be anywhere. But he hopes she's closer than he might know. The sooner, the sooner the better. So, but yeah, that's, 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 what I'm, that's what I'm praying for. So I pray every day for her to get here like, like now. So she don't, and she won't ever have to go through all that ever again. Many of the migrants I've talked to say they've had their phones stolen or lost along the journey. In fact, many of them hide their phones because that's how common it is for people to steal them along the way. Yeah, we can only imagine the anxiety of waiting and worrying about, you know, not knowing. So Sophia knows that her destination is Denver. Is he at all concerned about the communication ability when she does finally make it to town? Yes, that is one of his main concerns, that she's actually going to make it here, make it to the destination, and she's going to have no way to actually communicate with him. And so I reached out to the city to ask what that process is, and the city says that they do try to reunite people with friends or family that they have in the city for those who want to stay. So he's hopeful that he would receive, for instance, a phone call from someone from the city if she does arrive. Yeah, and you know, you know, technology plays a vital role here, especially apps like WhatsApp. So hopefully he gets some answers here very, very soon. Thank you, Angela.
Tonight's next question comes from Sharon in Aurora, who recently signed a petition she believed was just about setting new term limits for city council members and the mayor. I should have made more attempt to read it rather than listen to the person saying, this is just for um, to limit the terms of city council. There was no mention of the mayor position at all. Following our reporting that the petition would also eliminate the city manager position and give the mayor more executive power, Sharon wants to know if it's too late for her to remove her signature. Well, Sharon, you're not the only one that feels duped here. Earlier this month, a bipartisan group of Aurora City Councilors called the proposed ballot initiative misleading. Behind the petition is a group called Term Limits for a Better Aurora. If you signed that petition without realizing it would change the structure of city government, it takes some work to actually get your name off of that petition. Aurora City Clerk's Office tells us you can try asking the people circulating the petition to remove your name, but, you know, good luck with that. If that doesn't work and the petition is actually certified, you'll have to file a written protest for the clerk's office to consider removing your name. On this Memorial Day, we honor more than 2 million U.S. soldiers who have died while serving our country. 6,200 of those missing or killed in action were from Colorado. Events took place across the state today in their honor. In Brighton, the start of a new tradition, the new Adams County Veterans Memorial opened today. They kicked off their first Memorial Day tribute with a special guest. Ken Jones served on the USS Colorado during World War II. The 96-year-old traveled from Texas to see the memorial and the replica of the ship he served on 80 years ago. Jones has never actually lived in Colorado, but says he still feels a deep connection. It reminds me of being home because when I was living on the Colorado, that was my home. That's where we lived. That's where we ate. In Denver, people gathered at Fort Logan National Cemetery to place a wreath at each and every single headstone. More than 120,000 veterans and family members are buried there. Each Memorial Day serves as a promise to never forget the sacrifice of the men and women who died serving our country. But physical memorials can fade over time. And that's where you come in. Here's Kyle with an update on this week's Word of Thanks. Memorial Day weekend is most often a time for remembrance, but we have the opportunity to do something forward-looking for our community. There's a park on the west side of Denver, Joseph Martinez Park, named for the first Latino Medal of Honor recipient in World War II. The city is about to invest significantly to revitalize that park, and there's a community-led effort to build a tribute to Joseph Martinez at the center of that park, a tribute to Martinez, to other Latino veterans, to all who served, and in particular, Medal of Honor recipients. The public fundraising effort to build that memorial begins with this Word of Thanks campaign. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me and a bunch of other Coloradans in creating a lasting memorial to Private Martinez and to others who have served and sacrificed. Denver Water says its gross reservoir expansion will protect water access for over a million people. But how will they protect existing water sources from ongoing construction? And a 78-year-old runner does not let an injury break her four-decade streak in Boulder. Here we are, another Boulder Boulder under our, under our feet, under our wheels now. That's next. A massive dam and expansion project at Gross Reservoir will certainly benefit Denver water customers, nearly tripling the water storage. But how will that impact South Boulder Creek that runs below the dam? Denver Water says they have a plan to make sure those impacts are also positive. Here's Corey Reppenhagen. The utility Denver Water is in the process of expanding Gross Reservoir in Boulder County. That will impact 17 miles of South Boulder Creek, which runs below the dam. We're in a position to create enhancements. We want to do that. Sometimes, you know, we understand that what benefits us may benefit others and what benefits others may benefit us. Project manager Jeff Martin says in this case, making Gross Reservoir bigger can help make South Boulder Creek better. So we came up with the, the term the environmental pool and that's 5,000 acre feet of water storage behind Gross Dam 
that is dedicated to South Boulder Creek. The dam will be raised 131 feet by the year 2027, 125 feet for Denver water customers, nearly tripling the water capacity. The other six feet is for the environmental pool, water that will go into the creek during the time of year it normally runs low. You can put water in South Boulder Creek in the fall and winter to create more water to really enhance the fishery below to make sure the fish have water when they need it. Martin says healthy fish can improve the entire environment around the creek, including birds and other animal habitat. The water from the environmental pool is also meant to stay in Boulder County. And it's gonna go through the creek, provide a enhancement to the creek, and then later there's gonna be the opportunity for City of Boulder and City of Lafayette to pick it back out of the creek and use it for municipal water supply. Meteorologist Corey Reppenhagen for next. Opponents of the dam have also voiced concern about the water temperature in the creek getting too cold to maintain healthy fish populations that could result from increasing the depth of water in a reservoir. Denver Water says their studies have shown minimal impact, but they plan to monitor the changes in Boulder Creek and adjust if needed. Well, things look pretty nice on this Memorial Day here across the majority of not only the Denver area, but across eastern Colorado. That said, if we turned this camera around, things would look pretty dark and ominous. We have a storm that's moving its way through DIA, the last place that needs a storm right now. But statewide, again, a few storms, but for the most part across eastern Colorado, things are pretty A-OK -okay on this Memorial Day. That said, as I mentioned, the one spot that doesn't need a storm today, which would be Denver International Airport. Probably don't have to tell you. Lots of extra folks using the airport today. We did have a ground stop thanks to the storm that passed on by but that ground stop has since been lifted off to the south we've got a storm right near castle rock just the kind of south and west of castle rock maybe a little bit of small hail with this storm otherwise it looks like just one of those storms that you need to kind of pack up any of those outdoor items and bring those inside. Meantime, the far northeastern corner, this is where we've seen those strongest storms throughout our day today, and those storms starting to exit stage right, moving out into Kansas. One little storm also north and east of Fort Collins at this hour as well. Severe thunderstorm watch for Logan, Phillips, and Sedgwick counties here in the far northeastern corner. That goes till 9 p.m. tonight. That'll probably be canceled a little bit early because these storms already starting to move off to the east. Still a chance for one or two leftover storms tonight, but for the most part, things looking much calmer over the next few hours. Tomorrow, though, Maybe a slightly higher chance of a storm for us here along the I-25 corridor and a better chance for storms for us here across eastern Colorado as well. And then those chances for storms increase as the week wears on. So the seven-day forecast, as I mentioned, as the week wears on, those storm chances increase for us. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday in particular looking pretty stormy with more storms for the weekend. She's participated in Colorado's largest road race every year, and she wasn't going to stop after more than 40 years. I've never been in a wheelchair before. This is my first. A Boulder Boulder regular crosses the finish line again, thanks to some help from her friends. And the names change, but the sentiment stays the same. A look back at Memorial Days gone by next. Thousands of people turn out every year to participate in Colorado's largest road race, the Boulder Boulder 10K, but only a small number have ran every year since the race started way back in 1979. 78-year-old Kate Hilsenbeck is one of them, and this year she enlisted a few friends to help keep her four-decade streak going. Photojournalist Byron Reed caught up with her today. Memorial Day. Boulder Boulder Day. The music and the participation and the, the neighbors who all come out. My first Boulder Boulder was the first Boulder Boulder, 1979. There are six women who've done them all, including me. It was a challenge. I was doing four miles a day. And then Frank Shorter said, oh, yes, you can. And so I signed up. I've had cancer for a year. And I'm tr treating it, but who knows? I was not going to do it. I was going to hang up my shoes. But then one of my friends last weekend said, hey, have some fun with it. Just make, you know, wear your Superman cape and have some fun. I fell and broke my kneecap. I was... My grandchildren were here for spring break, and I was going to do some, walked into the living room, tripped on some kids' stuff, and went boom, right in front of the children. Every year since 1979, 
<laughs> I was a lot younger than a lot faster. <laughs> humiliating to be pushed you know I used to run it and now I've got a broken kneecap it was bittersweet I, I would rather be running than having being pushed in a wheelchair but but there we are another boulder boulder under our feet under our wheels now <laughs> and if I'm around next year I'll do it again how you feeling boulder boulder She's got great spirit. Kate had some help today from her best friend since high school and her neighbor both took turns pushing Kate's wheelchair the entire 10K. It's been a while since we've done some random Colorado history. This is where we look back at what made the news 100 years ago or more to remember what life was like way back then. We go back 120 years to May 29th, 1903 in the Rocky Ford at Enterprise newspaper. We see Memorial Day was once called Decoration Day. In this clip, a Reverend Nelson says the holiday should be a day of loving remembrance, not of sporting. He's quoted as saying to turn this day into one jollity is wholly foreign to its sentiment and purpose and should be discouraged. I also found this really cool photo uh, on the Denver Library uh, digital collection of what Decoration Day looked like back in 19 or 1888 in Colorado. This is in the town of Montrose. This was two years after the Civil War ended right around the time parades and decorating grave sites became tradition. The U.S. recognized Memorial Day as a federal holiday in 1971, creating the three-day weekend some of us now observe. No matter how you choose to spend the weekend, the executive director of Colorado Freedom Memorial in Aurora reminds us to set aside some time for reflection. 6,218 Coloradans left home to go serve their country, answer their country's call, to go defend freedom. Oftentimes in places they'd never been, were never ever going to go to, couldn't spell the name of the towns they were in and possibly had never heard of the country, but left because they were called to do it. And they gave their lives for that very freedom they swore to defend. On Memorial Day weekend, on this weekend, go have your barbecues, go camping, go golfing, go work in your yard, go do what you were going to do because they gave their lives protecting your ability to do that. So eat that hamburger heck up to them. But sometime this weekend, just sometime this weekend, give a little bit of time to reflect and be grateful that heroes like these lived. And we're back with the most Colorado thing we saw today, a silver lining to the Miller Moth invasion next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is free entertainment, courtesy of Mother Nature. Toby from Denver sent us this video of twins Blair and Marin, probably the only two Coloradans who are not tired of the Miller moth invasion yet. They're trying their best to catch the moth on the other side of the window. You know, kids, don't worry. There's probably like 10 more inside already. If you see something that feels like Colorado to you, you can email it to us at next at 9news.com or use the hashtag Hey next, I hope all of you have a great Memorial Day evening. Thanks for watching.